Good evening and welcome to the Literaturhaus Berlin Digital Program. Tonight we are joined by Nina Ansari. Nina Ansari is an American Iranian author and scholar, and she will introduce her latest book for us tonight. It is called Anonymous is a Woman, and it takes us on a 4,000 years long journey through gender discrimination. But what makes it so important and special is, is that it features 50 outstanding but forgotten women. So that we are introduced to very wonderful individuals that have been forgotten in our history. Um, Nina Ansari is talking to us from New York tonight and she will speak with the author and journalist Daniel Schreiber. And I'm very happy to welcome both of them tonight at the Literaturhaus Berlin Digital Program. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Schreiber, and I have the great pleasure and the great honor to talk to Nina Ansari tonight. Among other things about her eye-opening, fascinating, eminently important, and just brilliant new book, Anonymous is a Woman, A Global History of Gender Inequality. Hi, Nina. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm thrilled to be here with you. How, how are you today? How, how is New York? New York is great. We've started to open up a bit. Uh, the atmosphere is a little more livelier than um, five, six months ago. It feels for the first time there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And when you go out, people are out and about. And I, I feel uh, more hopeful now than I have in a while in terms of things moving towards uh, you know, improvement. And how are things with you? Are you you're in Berlin, correct? Yes, yes. And unfortunately, are not as great. I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, so but, things are on lockdown, right? Yes. And uh, the situation is much, much worse than in New York, partly because of the slow vaccination progress. But, but I feel it's, um, you know, it's, it gives me hope that, um, you know, you, you guys managed to get out of it more quickly. And uh, maybe that means that we will too very soon. I think you guys were doing better than us initially when we were in yeah. lockdown once or twice. I think Germany as a whole was doing better and then we, we switched. Uh, but um, so what is what is the lockdown period for you right now? Is it a is it a is it a weekly assessment or something they have narrowed down to a specific date where you open up gradually, obviously mm. open up? Mm. It's, it's not quite clear yet, unfortunately. And there are new laws every tomorrow. There will be a new law probably. Um, and um, yeah, so it's um, it. Yeah, it's no one can say exactly when when this will end or, or what the measures will be. Uh, but um, but um, I think we will talk about this uh, later on, and we'll also talk about this later on, what it means in relation to your book. Uh, but let me first introduce you properly, because, uh, and I will read this from my notes, because um, uh, your biography is a list of very impressive achievements, and I uh, would like our audience to know at least some of them. So Nina Ansari is an historian, a well-known activist for women's rights, and since 2018, a United Nations Women Champion for Innovation. She is the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the Women of Influence Award of the Iranian American Women Foundation, and Barnard College's Trailblazer Award. She grew up in New York City after her family emigrated from Iran, shortly before the Islamic Revolution in 1979. She holds an MA in Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies and a PhD in History from Columbia University. Her first book, Jewels of Allah, The Untold Story of Women in Iran, came out in 2015. It, set the records, it sets the record straight about the more often than not misunderstood history of women's rights in Iran. It unearthed a rich history of pre-feminist thoughts and movements, chronicled the role women played in the Iranian revolution, despite Ayatollah Khomeini's 
shocking views on women. And it shed light on how fundamentally involved Iran's women, women are in today's democratic movements in the country. The book garnered the International Book Award on women's issues and many other awards. Um, is that an adequate, adequate um, um, reading of your life? Thank Did you. Did I forget Daniel. something? No, you were lovely. And I wanted to add thank you for that introduction. You're very kind. And I wanted to add that I'm a huge fan of your work. And, um, and I'm honored to be in conversation with you. I wish it wasn't virtual. I wish it was in person, but hopefully I'll get to meet you and work with you in the future as well, because I'm a huge admirer of your work. So I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you very much. Um, you, you actually, you do make me blush. Um, and uh, <laughs> the honor is, is really mine. Um, you know, let, let me start out by reading a quote from an author I know we both admire. Uh, the quote is from Audre Lorde. That's her. I don't know whether people can see her. Um, and uh, and part, I want to read this quote partly because it encapsulates uh, the project of your new book, Anonymous is a Woman So Well, and partly because it, just in general it shows why we are all here um at this reading at this discussion and uh, why gender inequality is something that affects all of us in the most fundamental way the quote is from a keynote speech of women's of a women's studies conference in 1981 and lord says there i am not free while any woman is unfree even when her shackles are very different from my own and I am not free as long as one person of color remains chained, nor is any one of you. You yourself quote the speech in your book. What does this quote mean to you? Well, her quote, uh, her infamous quote, I am not free while any other woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own, is a powerful uh, statement in that in certain parts of the world, uh, the status of women as second-class citizens continues to be codified in policy and law. And in other nations, women have more freedom and more rights compared to the other countries. Uh, her statement means that even if some of us have it better than others, that doesn't exonerate other people and their plight, that uh, what is important for oppressed, anyone who's oppressed by discriminatory ideology, anybody who is a victim of human rights, uh, to know that they are being heard, that they are being given a voice, especially by those who, as Audre Lorde said, um, are not shackled in the same way they are. So in raising the import, it brings to the forefront the importance of raising awareness about the plight of others, and also brings to the forefront um, for everyone to take into consideration not only the cultural complexities, but also the historical complexities of what essentially constitutes varying definitions of womanhood. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, in, in a way, I feel you just um, described uh, the essence of your wonderful book. Um, and. Um, it's um for me i for me it really was a revelation to read it because um, um you could feel all these things that you just said um and they were stated in a very clear and wonderful way and we will talk about it a bit more uh, but uh, maybe first you you will read uh, a little excerpt of it sure i wanted to begin if okay with you with the opening paragraph of the book because i think it really sets the tone for the overall content um in 1929 british novelist virginia wolf ran her fingers along the spines of the book in her library wondering why no woman during shakespeare's era had written a word of that extraordinary literature when every other man, it seemed, was capable of song or sonnet. She concluded, indeed, I would venture to guess that a non who wrote so many poems without signing them was often a woman. Nearly a century after Wolfe penned those incisive words, 
frequently modified as for most of history, anonymous was a woman. The phenomenon of female anonymity persists as women worldwide continue to be restricted by society's formal and unspoken barriers. Throughout history, women have had, women have had to contend with overwhelming obstacles, preventing them from realizing their full potential. Although there has been incremental progress and advancement, women still have a long road to travel before they are equally represented within the global community. Why have women been consistently denied opportunities that are automatically given to men? And why does Virginia Woolf's statement still echo in the 21st century? Thank you. So, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you want to <laughs> <we've... laughs> um, You want to go a certain delay? Delay? Yeah, I think there was a delay. I don't I don't know if you have a question for me or you would like me to um, take, you know, take the uh, foundation of the book and begin the conversation. It's up to you. I, I, I do have a question for you, but it actually would um, go into that direction about the you know foundation, of you explaining the foundation of your book. Um, and um, I was just in general wondering, um, why did you choose um, the title Anonymous as a Woman, you know, which as you just heard is based on, on a quote by Virginia Woolf from her really influential and wonderful essay, A Womb of One's Own. Um, and I was wondering, um, um, obviously, you know, in today's world, female anonymity as such is not as big of a problem as it was in the Shakespeare's, Shakespearean times Wolf describes and, or, or as it was in Wolf's times. And, um, um, and yeah, and I was wondering why you still picked um, the title and um, why female anonymity um, is still such a disturbing issue. I love this question. Thank you. Well, the book's title is obviously based on a misquote because, you know, Virginia Woolf never actually said for most of history, Anonymous um, is a woman. I take it one step further. I misquote her misquote and I say Anonymous is still a woman. And how I came across this title is because in uh, one of, uh, I was supposed to give a speech in the UK on the current plight of women globally and the challenges they face. And in my research, I came upon a, a staggering and disturbing statistic, which is that even in the 21st century, women occupy a mere 0.5% of reported history. Now, uh, you know, I was born in Iran, pre-revolution Iran, and I left at 12 at the cusp of the Islamic Revolution of 1979. And from afar, I witnessed all the rights that women were given, taken away. And for over four decades now, um, the women in Iran have been fighting not only to regain their rights, but also to have, um, you know, be able to uh, choose their attire, things, everyday things that I do and I don't get penalized for, I don't get hand handed harsh sentences for. You know, they are pretty much debilitated in every aspect of society, uh, from child custody to divorce laws to inheritance laws, uh, you name it. They're forbidden from running for president or serving as judges. So from afar, I, I, I watched all those rights uh, taken away from them. And, uh, you know, when I came across this uh, disturbing statistic, I thought that can't possibly be that uh, women only occupy this minuscule percentage. And uh, this is a yet another arena where women, in my opinion, uh, I felt there are countless women who deserve to be on our in our history books and whose lives and legacies deserve to be known. One is because of the ethical argument, obviously, and two, I know the importance of having strong female role models, especially for young girls. Um, countless studies have shown that exposure to women who have excelled in so many different fields, specifically in fields where the number of women 
continue to remain low actually impacts them where um, their aspirations are concerned, where their level of education is concerned, and even where their passions are concerned. So if a young woman is passionate about being in the STEM field, but continuously feels that women are not as qualified as men to be in those fields, then that derails them. Uh, for, let me give you a statistic. In the US, women in the STEM field account for less than 20, 28%. Now, why is that? Well, uh, very few women who enter the STEM fields remain in the STEM fields because it's a male dominated bastion. Uh, they feel a lack of camaraderie, a lack of mentorship, a lack of female role models, and they often feel like the lone woman in the room. So approximately 32% of women who enter those fields end up leaving those fields. So providing role models in a historical context has tremendous benefits. Um, I'll give you another staggering statistic that Stanford University just released last year that if young girls were exposed to as many female innovators as young boys were to male innovators, the rate of female innovation would rise by as much as 164%. Now, that is, that is game changing. That is uh, an astronomical number. So this is how I came about with the title of the book. I thought if women in the 21st century still occupy a point 5% of recorded history, that's a huge inaccuracy. And we need to raise, increase the visibility of these women. And also for obvious reasons, uh, I picked the title because I thought, well, with that kind of a percentage, then Anonymous is still a woman. So there yes. you have the title of the book. Yeah. I, you know, I'd like to talk more about role models because I, I think part of the impressive achievement of Anonymous as a woman lies in its broad scope. Um, you go back uh, as you know as far as over four thousand years in history and mm -hmm. uh, find role models that most of us, you know, didn't know of. Uh, but uh, you also, you know, you take a, a very consequential global perspective, um, and and I think that's especially in today's world, that's important mm -hmm. and also very interesting because especially like feminism especially is often portrayed, um, you know, as coming from, you know, white American and European middle-class women. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, you point to historical pre-feminist and feminist movements in India, in Japan, mm -hmm. in South America, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I think I have two questions related to this. So, I mean, you know, the first question is very simple. Like, why do you think um, this kind of perspective has been missing so far? And the second question is like, you know, how difficult was the research in the book? Because uh, many of the women you mentioned, I've never heard of. And um, I'm sure many people haven't either. Okay, so to, to answer your first question, uh, you know, feminism is really considered to be more or less of a Western phenomenon, and a lot of countries don't feel it necessarily applies to the women and the plight of women in their country. Uh, in its broadest terms, feminism is um, having equal rights and opportunities. I, I want to quote one of my favorite authors, um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, and she, I think, said it best. She said, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. For me as a woman, um, being born in Iran and um, having lived in America, and so having had the benefits of two different worlds, I feel that Mary Wollstonecraft's statement really best encapsulates what it means to be a feminist. Um, in terms of these women, um, as I mentioned, uh, there are thousands of women, thousands of women who have excelled in practically every field, thousands of women who thousands of years ago proved that being good at math or science, for example, was not gender specific. I wanted to, first of all, 
include all these women and it's impossible. I would need to have to write one encyclopedia after another. But I wanted to pick diverse women, women from different countries, women um, confined to a specific period. So I narrowed it down to prior to 1900. Why? Because opportunities were even less available to women. This was an era where women were not permitted to get an education. They were not allowed to hold positions in society. And all these women excelled in practically every field despite all the obstacles. So one, it was important to tell their story. Two, I wanted to pick a number of women as well who had scant name or almost no name recognition when you compare them directly to their male counterparts. Um, another reason for picking another group of women was that um, they initially, uh, a lot of the men in their lives took credit for their work solely because they were a woman, solely because they didn't have the rights, they didn't have a voice, until it was discovered years later that they were in fact responsible for these discoveries, for these accomplishments. So I wanted to have, for lack of a better term, a mixed bag of women, women who represented different countries, different cultures, different fields, different ethnicities, and different socioeconomic backgrounds. And what every one of these women have in common is their passion, their courage, their resilience, and of course, their brilliant minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, you know, and I, um, for me, it was especially important to, to, you know, to have that wide perspective that you have, because I, uh, I, I certainly have, you know, missed that perspective. And I think it's, um, um, you know, even during the last few years where, you know, where mm -hmm. we have this, you know, sort of a third wave of feminism, um, mm -hmm. even, you know, when in times you talk about intersectionality, um, mm -hmm. you know, this, there's so much we don't know. And, uh, you know, there's so much history we have no idea of. And, and this is, you know, why I, I love your book. That's one reason. And, um, and I, um, and, and I'm, and I think I also would like to talk with you about, um, you know, this third wave of feminism, because in, in a way I feel, um, you know, I mean, for instance, the Me Too movement really has changed the way many people thought about, you know, think about sexual violence. The mm -hmm. Women's March of uh, 2017 was the biggest protest in history to date. Uh, the so important Black Lives Matter movement was founded mm -hmm. and is mainly organized by women, which, you know, a fact which is very often overlooked. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one could say that these developments stopped some, you know, some sort of public gaslighting, which we were all mm -hmm. involved in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I believed and many of us believed that, um, you know, this the main fiction of our society that we all have the same chances, uh, that we're all equal. And if we just work hard, uh, you know, we can all achieve the same things. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, and this fiction, you know, of course, covered up the truth that for women and for minorities, there are just not mm -hmm. as many seats at the table as there were for straight white men. And um, mm -hmm. so what do you feel when you look at these developments um, today? Like, do they give you hope or do you feel... Um, we are, you know, we are so far from equality um, that, um, you know, it's, you just feel it's not enough and, um, you know, it, yeah. Well, to your point, you know, there has been, and I mentioned when I read the beginning paragraph of my book, we, there has been a lot of advancement. There's also been a lot of setbacks. I mentioned countries like countries like Iran where you had women who were given a lot of rights in the 60s and 70s specifically, and those rights were revoked almost immediately. If you look at countries like Turkey that were also, thanks to Ataturk's um, vision, 
uh, were emancipated a long time ago, specifically something that was unusual for the Middle East. And now you look at Turkey and just last month, um, Erdogan withdrew from the Istanbul Convention, which gave women protection against gender-based violence. And a member of his cabinet justified this withdrawal as the constitution we feel to provide sufficient protection for women, as do the bylaws. Well, in, as far as women's uh, rights activists in the global community are concerned, this is a disheartening setback. So the pushback on women's rights in countries like Iran, the withdrawals from treaties that provide women extra protection, especially where violence is concerned, like countries like Turkey, are important reminders that we cannot afford to be complacent in our assumption of linear progression when it comes to gender equality and women's rights. And I think the same can be said about pretty much everybody except, as you said, the white male man um, who really uh, uh, it's I think it's difficult for them to comprehend what it means not to be equal in society, what it means to be legally debilitated um, in society and what the repercussions of holding back certain segments of the population, which is you know what we see today uh, globally really reflects, not only the vision and capabilities of only a fraction of human potential, but aside from the ethical and moral injustice of it, uh, you can't help but think what society would look like today if everyone was given equal rights and opportunities. That's a huge question. And if we don't raise awareness, if we don't continuously advocate then each and every one of us is complicit um, in this ongoing um, cycle. Uh, it's really an, a, a stain on the human record. And it wasn't always like that. When you look back in history, especially primitive society, women and men were pretty much on um, equal standing. Each one had a specific task they performed. And all that changed um, with the uh, discovery of agriculture and the domestication of animals, which largely freed man up from his day-to-day -day hunting and food gathering to going into a more cultural uh, and industrial climate. And man slowly began to take the reins in society and establish social systems that in essence served his needs over that of the woman's. But what's important about why I bring this story up is because Women's inferiority is really the product of a social system that has produced and fostered countless other inferiorities, discriminations, and degradations. And that is something that has been had, had ripple effects for centuries and continues in the 21st century despite progress and advancement. My point is we can't take any progress or advancement we make for granted. And we continuously have to not only work to ensure that they remain in place, but that we continue to build on them so that we can hopefully for everyone to have parity and equality in all sectors. And what that requires, yes, it's a tremendous undertaking, but it requires collective action. It requires targeted action. And it is, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, an uphill battle. But I always like to look at the glasses as um, half full and not half empty. So I have hope. I work with hope. I work uh, for me, what I do, it's a labor of love. And I think the more we put aside our differences and focus on the task at hand, the more successful we hope to be. Mm. I'm, I'm I'm so glad you, you said that because, um, you know, for me, from a very different perspective, from a queer perspective, I, I feel that uh, so many rights uh, queer people have um, uh, garnered during the last years, um, you know, I, I don't feel that they are safe. You know, like my my mm -hmm. suspicion is that they, you know, they can be taken away as easily as, uh, you know, We've got them, exactly. and um, your examples from Iran and, and Turkey um, are such, um, 
yeah, you know, fundamental warning signs and uh, reminders of, um, you know, history is not linear, you know, and um, yeah. And I, and I, you know, not to mention, um, you know, how history would have been if last year's elections would have had a different result, you know, um, yes, I I... it's um, much closer than, than, you know, we think. But... It's around the corner, but, but you brought up Black Lives Matter as well. And I wanted to touch on from a historical perspective, take, you know, use Black Lives Matter, as you mentioned, as, as a barometer and say that as, a, as someone who has uh, studied centuries of disparities within the system. Um, what is important to note is that it is possible to bring about meaningful and lasting change because history has proven, there are instances, uh, if I may correct myself, that history has proven that social movements tend to achieve tangible results when they reach a critical mass, meaning the more unified and large they are. And I'll go back in history to show you uh, two specific examples of what I mean, and then we will bring it into Black Lives Matter. In 1930, Indian activist Mahatma Gandhi set out on a 241 mile march with 71 followers to the sea in pro protest of British rule over India. And by the time he reached the coast, thousands had joined in his procession and they were all from all walks of life. Similarly, in 1955, Alabama, American seamstress Rosa Parks uh, refused to vacate her bus seat for a white man. And soon millions all over America from all walks of life again were uh, staging sit-in boycotts and demonstrations. Now, on two different continents, under two very different circumstances, what began essentially as a protest over British rule led to the um, independence of India, resulted in the independence of India, and what began as a refusal to give up a bus seat resulted in the end of legalized segregation in America. And if you look at Black Lives Matter and what really prompted this movement and how it erupted, and you're talking, it really came to a boiling point during COVID crisis, um, where you uh, had specifically the horrific incident with George Floyd, and you had people coming out in mass protest, rightfully so. Now, this kind of a protest uh, really represents legitimate anger and legitimate frustration at the inability of a system to reform itself. Okay, legitimate anger and frustration of a judicial system, of a police system that in essence requires reform. Because if you recall, uh, Mr. Chauvin, after what he did to George Floyd, just walked away and went home. He was not even initially arrested. What prompted his arrest was mass riots, right? Mass protests. Globally, this turned into a global movement, which to my point, I go back to 1930 India, I go back to 1955 in America. And as I said, um, you know, social movements tend to achieve tangible results when they reach a critical mass. Now, had it not been for people rioting and protesting this horrific incident, and even more horrific was Derek Chauvin just walking away and walking home, Derek Chauvin would not have been arrested. And just yesterday, he was found guilty, okay? And his, we we're waiting, awaiting his sentencing, but that was a huge wake up call and speaks to the power of people and speaks again to the power of collective action, speaks to the power of solidarity. And that in essence, we can see the end result is huge, is huge because mm -hmm. everybody who came out there to protest in essence, put aside whatever differences they had and focused in on the moral and ethical issue of this grave injustice. So I have, this is why I have hope. My job is to present obviously an accurate picture, but, and sometimes the picture is very dark and very ugly. Um, but I like to believe that 
um, with incidences like yesterday's conviction um, and many other instances where people have prevailed, where justice has prevailed, that's when I like to take a dark incident and say, well, you know, humanity has prevailed and light has prevailed over dark, for lack of a better word. So yes, I work with hope. And, and you know, again, there are many instances in history where um, we, when we all come together, we can really be instrumental and our voices have power. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I so agree. And I, you know, I, I share your feeling of hope. Um, and, um, and especially like the yesterday's word verdict, I, to me, it felt like a breakthrough. And, um, mm -hmm. and it felt like even like three years ago, this would have been unimaginable this verdict and that really you know it really felt yesterday like something something fundamental and very important changed mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but you know like maybe we can talk a little bit more about how to um you know to make change happen because i mm -hmm. um i'm i'm wondering whether relying on these social movements is enough you know whether it's enough to <laughs> wait for uh, a Rosa Parks to happen or to or for Mahatma Gandhi to, to come along. And, um, and I'm reminded of um, uh, something you write in the book, a, a speech you are like a, an article, I think it is you, you quote by, um, um, I think the Icelandic prime minister, um, um, by right. a very important Icelandic. Yes, she, she, she mm -hmm. works in the Ministry of Culture in Iceland, yes. Uh, Magna, yes. Maria um, Nostalir, if I'm pronouncing her name right. Yes, she works with the Equality Unit of the Ministry of Culture in Iceland. Yes. And then you quote her in, um, by comparing all the statistics of the Western developed world, which, um, you know, are quite shocking, to be honest, and are much worse than, you know, we, we'd like to think they are. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and and Iceland is you know always heralded as this like big example of gender equality and mm -hmm. uh, and even Iceland you know like the like the you know the beacon of liberalism only has a I think eighty five um, percent gender equality and um, mm -hmm. and what. Um, what the politician said was that what she found out was that, you know, um, it's not enough to, you know, wait for things to happen. You know, you need uh, mm -hmm. political measures, you need quotas, you need, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, you know, yeah, political measures. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I agree with her. One is, you know, we can't just wait for different social movements to erupt and hope to enact meaningful change. That's just a part of the puzzle. It's a, all of these are part of the puzzles and need to come together. I do agree with Mike now. Well, one, just for our audience who's listening, um, Iceland tops, has topped the top, uh, been in the top 10 of the global gender gap index for the last 10 years in a row, every published annually by the World Economic Forum. 153 countries are ranked in terms of where they stand with respect to women's rights and gender equality, specifically in four different sectors, economic opportunity, political empowerment, health and survival and education. And Iceland always tops the list along with Norway, Sweden, Finland, Nicaragua, Rwanda, and New Zealand. And so um, what uh, Magneo was saying, in essence, is gender equality just does not come about of its own accord. It requires um, everything from political will to gender quotas um, to par uh, participation across numerous sectors, everything from the private sector to human and women's rights organization. It requires ambitious strategies, including combating gender-based violence, uh, you know, addressing the care economy, addressing unequal pay for equal work, uh, addressing uh, insufficient legislation, um, providing comprehensive legal frameworks, and so on and so on. What is most disturbing, Daniel, which you brought about, which, you know, when you 
and I'm not a numbers person, I'm very bad with numbers, I hate to say, but when you look at the Global Gender Gap Index um, and you look at the statistics, they're eye-opening, they're alarming, specifically in countries where you thought or you assume have made tremendous progress and you look at the rankings and you are horrified. Like I'll give you an example, the United States. Uh, of 153 countries uh, that, have, that are studied and ranked annually by the World Economic Forum, the US today comes in at 53. Uh, what's more appalling is right before COVID in 2019, the US ranked 51, and in 2015, the US ranked 28. So the US uh, since 2015 has not only progressed, but they have regressed and dropped 28 points in ranking. Uh, same with the UK, the UK obviously not as bad as the US. Uh, UK in 2019, prior to COVID, ranked uh, 19, uh, 15, and today it ranks 21. So again, another country which is seemingly at the forefront of women's rights and gender equality has regressed again. Now, in order to see what, uh, how we can uh, move past uh, these setbacks, you should look at the countries that um, always rank in the top 10 and what accounts for their successes. Well, we could be here for days and I could go through what uh, you know qualifies them to be in the top 10. But if you look at Iceland, for example, Iceland enforces quota systems specifically for women on company boards. Currently 40%, women occupy 40% of company seats. If you look at women in the workforce, Iceland, there are 86% of women are in the workforce compared to globally, that number stands at 56%. Norway, which also ranks in the top 10, 95% of women are in the workforce, again, compared to 56% globally. For men, globally, it's 76%. Uh, you know, what accounts for their successes is enforcement. Also, if you look at Iceland, they broadly value human capital in their economies and have phenomenal safety nets in place, which make it possible for family, for parents to work and have a family. Um, they also uh, make it possible to have paid family leave. If you look at the U.S., one of the biggest shocking things I found out about in about the U.S. in the course of my research was that the U.S. is the only OECD member that except for six states, including Washington, D.C., mothers are entitled by federal law to zero, zero days paid family leave. Now that is horrific. And when you compare it, for example, to Finland, where mothers get up to three years, or Norway, where they get up to 91 weeks, or Canada one year, or even the UK 39 years, 39 weeks, that is a horrific statistic. Um, so these are some of the spider cracks in the system which account for why the US, for example, has regressed. So we need to address our care economy and drive transformative change by um, making uh, you know, care available and affordable to anybody who needs it. Uh, currently in the US, women, whether they work or not, carry a disproportionate amount of care work, which has only increased with COVID because of lockdowns, because of online schooling. That has additionally added to the number of hours women put in housework. Um, it's especially daunting for women who work and have young children because it is uh, they have taken on the responsibility of the majority of online schooling and that obviously impact their ability to be productive working from the house as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a very important argument you make in the book is that um, gender equality is not just an ethical issue, it's also an economic issue. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's safe to say that economics in general still has a diversity problem. Um, and, um, and I think it's um, something that most people just don't realize uh, how important diversity is for functioning economies mm -hmm. and how, mm -hmm. um, how much better our econo economies could be 
uh, mm -hmm. if we had gender equality. Um, yeah, I also and, um, inclusivity as well, not just gender equality, but uh, to your point, um, how we continue to have economic setbacks because we continue to have a more or less homogenous group of people in the economic sector, in the labor force. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, you know, if I'm reminded of, um, um, of an interview with a sociologist I, I recently listened to, and, um, and, and he pointed out that, um, you know, for instance, in the US, like the Reagan era, uh, which is always view, viewed at this, you know, uh, economic boom time where, you know, like, um, um, you know, the, the core of American identity was shaped and formed. And, um, and um, what peop most people overlook is that um, it was, you know, such an economic boom time, partly because so many women became part of the workforce and and so many African American people um, had be got better jobs than the ones they got before. And um, and so it's it's also I feel a problem of economics of like the um, science of, of you know of economic matters uh, just because you know if we uh, don't see that and if we don't um, um, you know if, if we don't count these histories in in a way they you know uh, should be um, narrated, mm -hmm. like then you mm -hmm. know we can't see what um, you know like the perspective. And I hope I make a little bit of sense. Right. At least. No, <laughs> so basically, gender equality, diversity, and inclusivity, aside again from the ethical argument, are necessary for sustainable development. Which is to your point. Uh, you know, just recently, according to McKinsey and company, um, if we were to close the gender gap, that would yield approximately $13 trillion in global GDP by the year 2030. Uh, well, that's huge. Not, it's specifically even more huge now because of all the economic downturn owed to the COVID crisis. So the, uh, you know, the argument that diversity does yield profitability. Countless studies have come out that show that diverse groups make better decisions than homogenous groups with direct implications for revenue performance. You know, you we talked about enforcing gender quotas like countries like Iceland do. It's one thing to enforce a gender quota and it's a whole other thing for companies to view diversity and embrace it as a necessary asset because all too often, sadly, companies view inclusivity as solely a moral obligation. And they don't look at the layers that go, uh, go hand in hand with having a diverse group of people. And also, uh, you have to take into account uh, that prior to COVID, uh, the World Economic Forum had predicted that the um, global gender gap in the economic sector would take another 257 years to reach parity between men and women. That number will, in my projection, in all likelihood worsen um, if both immediate and long-term measures aren't taken. And you spoke earlier, Daniel, about um, uh, Iceland closing 85% of its gender gap. Well, you know, if you look at Iceland and the political sector, the political sector is actually the most difficult to close the gender gap. Iceland to date has closed 70% of its gender gap in the political sector. And again, we talked about America being seemingly at the forefront of advancement. America to date has only closed 16% of its gender gap. And then you look at countries like Rwanda, who just recently became the first country ever to have a majority of women in its government with women holding 62% of the country's national legislature. Or you look at Ethiopia, for example, that just uh, in 2020 closed 70%, had reached 70% gender parity and reached 100% parity in its health and survival sub-index. And then you look at um, countries like Saudi Arabia, who are 
infamous for women's rights violations and for gender inequality. And they have actually made tremendous headway as part of their vision 2030. So it can be done. But to your point, it requires not only political will, not only mass protests, not only solidarity, but consistent work because remember we touched on it, just because we get something doesn't mean it's forever. And uh, we have to try to hold on to what we have and continue to build on it because, you know, obviously we all want to reap the benefits of a more equitable world. Yeah, but, and the other component is why should anyone not have equal rights? Why should everyone not have equal opportunities? Our uh, color, race, sexual orientation, creed, culture does not make one lesser than the other. So to my point, if uh, more people can have their mindsets changed and you know not be beholden to outdated stereotypical assumptions about everybody, whether it's about women, whether it's about a person of color, whether it's about a person of different sexuality than theirs, you know, to dispense with all those preconceived notions that continue to hold all of us back because it's really about our collective potential as a human race. Yes, um, yes, I wholeheartedly agree. And um, um, yeah, I, I could listen to you um, all night long. <laughs> and um, well, no, it's um, lovely to talk. I wish I could be with you in person. <laughs> that would yes, be a I think it's yeah. people person. So for me, virtually is just, I don't feel people's energy. Although I, I love your energy, I can feel it. And I love, I can talk to you for days. Um, and I'm not sure where we are time wise, or if we wanted to touch on some of the women in the book you had brought up earlier and, you know, some of their life stories and what it means for young women specifically in the 21st century. Um, that would be I, nice. If not, we could continue talking about um, yeah. whatever obstacles we have in our way, which are which are monumental. <laughs> but um, <laughs> nevertheless, I feel we can, we, they can be overcome one step at a time. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yes, we, I think we have more or less like 15 minutes and uh, maybe it would be a good time now to uh, talk about that section of, of your book, which is called Forgotten Innovators, um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I feel it's such an, I mean, we've mentioned some of the stories before, the, you know, the, the women you portrayed before, but um, it's such a, it really is, um, you know, one part of the heart of the book for me. Um, you describe the lives of 50 women, um, that were forced to stay largely anonymous by a history written mm -hmm. by, by the patriarchy. And um, I, I have to look at my notes because, um, you know, like some some of the uh, biographical sketches are just like right, so well, fascinating. And I, and I, yeah. When you and I mm -hmm. spoke briefly, you had asked uh, last week, um, you would ask who some of my favorite women were and why. I yes. thought that was an interesting yeah. question you brought up. I thought it was a difficult question you brought up because it's almost like picking your favorite child. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> I, I did give it some thought. Thank you for bringing it up earlier because I like to say I love all the women for different reasons. But there are some that their stories are particularly illuminating with respect to their quest for equality. Mm -hmm. Let me, I, I will ask that question again in a bit, but, but let me um, point, like, I just want to mention a few more of the uh, women you portray. So there's a, the first, the world's first female astronomer um, in mm -hmm. 2300 BC. Uh, you, there's a section about one of the world's first chemists, which was a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, you um, you know you write about an about an Ethiopian queen who defended her country against the Romans, um, mm -hmm. the woman who revolutionized Chinese medicine five hundred years ago. Uh, you've mentioned Lisa Meitner who discovered nuclear fission, um, or like a favorite of mine, the the Russian mathematician Sofia Kovalevskaya, and um, and I and I think it's. Um, 
and it, my point is that um, I think it's so breathtaking and wonderful to read all these biographies because um, most of us don't know about these women and um, those women largely have stayed actually anonymous um, and um, yeah so 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 thank you for that and and now thank you have you. to tell me who your favorites are thank you. it's so kind and um i can't tell you how much i appreciate uh, what you said and 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 for taking the time to to look and read through all these women and and you know to for you to give them a voice you know because you're mentioning their names and every time you mention a woman who's anonymous um you've um, we're one step closer. So, you know, you asked me who, um, obviously, all, all of them are inspirational, and I hope they inspire others to go find and bring out, you know, make a lot of other women who deserve to be in our history books, who deserve to have visibility, bring out their names. I hope it encourages more names of women to come out who are deserving to be heard and recognized and lauded for their accomplishments. One of my um, favorites, as you mentioned, is Lisa Meitner, who was an Austrian physicist who led in the discovery of nuclear fission. Now in 1949, her colleague, Dr. Otto Hahn, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry and Lisa did not for their shared discovery. To his credit, Dr. Hahn, and I'm sure you, as you read this, did submit her name to the Nobel Committee, Prize Committee, 10 times, 10 times. And each time they rejected her. Um, so that to me is, and again, she remains solely unknown um, because she's a woman, because the Nobel Prize Committee members didn't think she deserved the Nobel Prize, despite the fact that Dr. Otto Hahn appealed um, the 10 times is no joke. Uh, so you look at her life story and think, you know, the degradation uh, she suffered as a woman, the humiliation of not being acknowledged. Um, and she's not just the only one. There are countless women who remain unknown solely because they're women. Another fascinating woman is Elizabeth Freeman, who in 1781 became uh, was uh, filed for a lawsuit to successfully sued and went, won a lawsuit and won her freedom. She was actually the first slave in the state of Massachusetts to do so. And her victory eventually resulted in the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. What is most powerful about her story is when I was researching her is how did a woman who in essence did not even own herself have the courage to file a lawsuit at that time. Um, her story is also uh, not only powerful, just fascinating, a fascinating journey of a woman who was determined to own herself. Um, and again, among the countless women who deserve to be household names and deserve to feature, be featured prominently in history and are not. Mm -hmm. I, I know you've also prepared um, uh, re in two readings about um, two women, and um, mm -hmm. and maybe now would be a good time. I think the first reading is about uh, is about Alessandra Giuliani, um, who mm -hmm. early in the 14th century invented a way to observe the human cardiovascular system, and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. second reading is about Eunice Newton Foote, who in the mm -hmm. 19th century discovered the greenhouse effect. Exactly. So she, I, would you like me to read both of their excerpts? Yeah, or, or as, as you like, or read one or like oh. you. Oh, okay. I can read you maybe a condensed version of both. That way we leave okay. something for the readers to, to um, look into. So we don't, we don't provide the full picture. We provide a partial narrative if that's, so, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Um, Perfect. I'll start with chronologically with Alessandra Giuliani, who was a 14th century Italian anatomist who invented a technique to view blood vessels. At a time when women in most parts of the world were not allowed to get up to pursue a higher education, Alessandra Giuliani attended the University of Bologna in 1323. 
Her field of interest was anatomy, and one of her instructors, an anatomist and physicist, believed that to have a complete medical education, his students should know about the human body by means of dissection. Giuliani became his preceptor, an individual tasked with preparing a dissection for a demonstration specifically in schools and hospitals. She developed a method for draining blood from vessels and replacing it with colored dye, facilitating the observation of cardiovascular structures. It is important to note that there is dispute over Giuliani's existence. It has been argued that lawyer, historian, and noted forger Alessandro Machiavelli either invented or embellished Giuliani's life and accomplishments. This claim isn't without basis. Machiavelli did indeed engage in forgery to enhance the life story of medieval Bolognese jurist and lecturer Petizia Gozzadini. Machiavelli did not, however, invent Gozzadini, but rather built upon her original 16th century biography. This suggests he may have given Giuliani a similar treatment. Assuming Giuliani did exist, it is equally important to, important to understand that her status as a woman, particularly a woman in the medical field, perhaps contributed to her limited historical record. This book accepts Giuliani's existence as valid. And the next lady I would um, like to read is American scientist Eunice Newton Foote. Um, Eunice Newton Foote, 19th century American scientist who discovered the principal cause of global warming. It is one of the most significant findings to impact the survival of our planet, and yet it took more than 150 years for the scientist who made this vital discovery to be adequately acknowledged. Perhaps her gender had something to do with the long wait. On August 23, 1856, at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a paper was delivered entitled Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. The paper anticipated the revolution in climate science by experimentally demonstrating the effects of the sun on certain gases, and for the first time theorizing how those gases would interact with the Earth's atmosphere. Its author, Eunice Newton Foote, was not permitted to read her own paper due to the American Association for the Advancement of Science's own regulations regarding the distinctions between male and female members. Instead, Professor John Henry of the Smithsonian Institution presented her work. The University of California Santa Barbara Symposium lays out the significance of Foote's momentous and increasingly relevant contribution. Eunice Foote was the first person to demonstrate that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. She was also the first person to recognize that an atmosphere with more carbon dioxide would lead to an Earth with a higher temperature. In her own way, her discoveries rank in importance with or Darwin's origin of the species for contemporary cultural and scientific debates. And though there are thousands of books written about Darwin, none exists regarding Eunice's foot. She remains totally unknown to this day, solely because she was born a woman. Telling her story today has never been more compelling because it enhances the visibility of women in science and their significant contributions. Setting the record straight about the importance of women in the history of science counters the notion that women are not as capable in math and science as men. In her article entitled, This Lady Scientist Defined the Greenhouse Effect but Didn't Get the Credit, Smithsonian journalist Layla McNeil explains Foote was in fact years ahead of her time. What she described and theorized was the gradual warming of the Earth's atmosphere, what we call today the greenhouse effect. McNeil points out that three years later, the well-known Irish physicist, 
John Tyndall published similar results demonstrating the greenhouse effects of certain gases, including carbonic acid, and that his work is widely accepted as the foundation of modern climate science, while Foote's remains in total obscurity. I, yeah, I have so many, I have so many emotions. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, I'm, well, you know, they also went through, who the men took credit for their, and their lives initially took credit for their work, and then it was discovered years later that it was actually not the man, but the woman herself who had, who had made the discovery or whatever accomplishment. Those are even more heart-wrenching. Um, and yeah, they were only yeah. able to do so because of, you know, their position in lives. Yeah. Yeah, and I could, you know, this, um, um, this palpable unfairness, like, run through all of these biographical sketches. Um, and it's, um, yeah, and that's, you know, one you know, reason alone why people should read this book. And um, you. Uh, why you. people should get to know these women. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been really such a pleasure talking to you today. The same here. Yeah. And I, um, Thank you. as I Not said, with the long yes. term, I hope you open up so I can visit Berlin and, and, and meet you hopefully in person someday. I, I would love that. And if you're in Berlin, please let's definitely let's meet up. Please, I, I would love I, to I, I make a dinner for you. Well, oh, you're so, well, I'll definitely come then. If you're ever in New York or ever in Los Angeles, please come and you're welcome to stay with me and I'll make you dinner out. I don't know if you like Persian food, but that's one of my I specialties. Love Persian food. Oh, really? I okay. Love so you, food. you have an yes. open-ended invitation to come stay with me and I will wine and dine you. <laughs> so it would be my pleasure. Thank you, Danny. So, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nina. It was a pleasure. Likewise, thank you.